The most dangerous thing about Manson is that he believed he was the reincarnation of Jesus. He actually enacted the crucifixion in front of his followers. Manson came to believe he was Jesus because of Scientology. John, what can you tell me about the foundations of Scientology in, in black magic and crazy things like that? It's a curious thing that, that people are involved in Scientology unless they pay very, very close attention will have any idea that Ron Hubbard, Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, was actually deeply involved in magic. And he, you know, as I say, if they pay close attention, that there, there is there are some 1952 lectures where, you know, if you sat and listened to Ron Hubbard for six weeks, you ended up with a doctorate. Which is pretty good, isn't it? It's a lot easier than the other ways of getting a doctorate. And this is called the Philadelphia Doctorate Course. And in these lectures, um, he spoke about Alistair Crowley being his, I think, was a very good friend. They never actually met. Um, and Crowley thought that, that he was a confidence trickster. That's what Crowley said. But he also, he defends Crowley's uh, practices in, in, in that lecture. or in, Sorry, in one of those lectures. And we find that, digging back a little further, in 1946, Ron Hubbard was involved with a, a magical ceremony within the Crowleyite tradition with a man called Jack Parsons. Now, Parsons was one of the founders of Jet Propulsion Laboratories um, at the California Institute of Technology. He was the inventor of solid fuel for rockets, without which the moon landings would not have been possible. So he's quite an eminent, if not preeminent, figure. And um, he was deeply into Crowley's magic. And so in January 1946, on his terminal leave from the Navy, now, of course, Hubbard tells us that he was crippled and blinded at the end of World War II. He also elsewhere tells us that he beat up three petty officers on the 25th of July 1945. So there's a little bit of a paradox there as to how he did it. A Scientologist once explained to me and said, it's obvious he had two bodies. Oh, yeah, I hadn't, th I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> well, they said that with, with no irony. No. Uh, one of the bodies was crippled and blinded in Oaknell Hospital, and the other was beating up petty officers. Um, and, you know, whatever. But the reality is that however crippled and blinded he was, when he was on his terminal leave, he went and stayed um, at Jack Parsons' house in Pasadena in Los Angeles. And they performed what has become a very famous uh, ritual called the Babylon working because Alistair Crowley couldn't spell the word Babylon and so put an A in it and we have Babylon and uh, Jack Parsons actually made a disc recording of these ceremonies and published the transcript so we have the whole ceremony um, I think I was the first person to realize that this ceremony is the eighth degree of the Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO, which was the magical group that, that Crowley inherited uh, before the First World War. It's a, actually a German organisation. Uh, its sister group, and this does get elaborate, the Tool group, actually contained five senior members of the Nazi party and um, who practised ritual magic of a similar type. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I including... Um, Himmler, the founder of, of the SS. Uh, and indeed, the SS went through magical rituals. This is all another subject we might talk about one day. But far yeah. too much time looking at this stuff. Well, but Can I just ask about, just to go back a bit, just for people who don't know about what magic is in this sense, because it's got a mm. K on the end. Why has it got a K on the end? And who is Alistair Crowley, for just those who don't know? Fair enough. As I say, Alistair Crowley couldn't spell very well. So not only Babylon, Babylon, but magic, magic. And um, it, to give it its full title, it's sex magic. I don't know if, if YouTube will allow us to use the word sex anymore. Um, but it is a perfectly normal thing that consenting adults do. What can I say? Um, so yeah. Crow Crowley had, had come out of a... He was an Englishman who um, was called uh, the wickedest man in the world by the, that great authority, the News of the World newspaper. And that title sort of stuck with him. He was also on uh, Adolf Hitler's hit list, Crowley, that, that when they took Britain, they, he was one of the people to be rounded up and shot 
Um, so it obviously was quite annoying. Um, and he'd been involved with um, a guy called McGregor Mathers um, and in a, a group called The Golden Dawn, and um, which the poet W.B. Yeats was also involved with. And they performed magical rituals. Um, rituals were basically set to gain power over um, disembodied souls. And, you know, people think about magic in the kind of Disney sense that you have these little spells and enchantments and all this. But ritual magicians very often, historically, use um, or believe they're using discarnate spirits um, that they then load with some horrible idea that they then thrust at somebody else. Alistair Crowley is the most famous ritual magician of the 20th century. Um, and, and, you know, so to make it really clear, this is not magic in the sense of Derren Brown and conjuring. This is magic in the sense of believing that you can control other people through intention. Now, this is very important to understanding Scientology because Scientology is totally about controlling other people through your intention. You're meant to achieve this state, the operating Thetan state, where you can intend something to happen and it will happen. And so if you want somebody to fall in love with you, they will fall in love with you. Uh, if you want somebody to give you a load of money, they will give you a load of money. Um, but what Hubbard was doing was a, with pa Jack Parsons in 1946 was a great deal more sinister than this. They were trying to incarnate um, the Antichrist, fundamental Babylon, wow. the Scarlet Woman, who's spoken about in the book of Revelation of St. John the Divine, the last book of the Gospels. And th this is the destroyer of mankind, and that's what they were after. And um, it, it ended badly. Hubbard ran off with Jack Parsons' girlfriend, who was also Jack Parsons' sister-in-law. This gets very confusing. And Hubbard managed to convince Parsons to give him all of his savings. 1946, this was $35,000. And he goes off to Florida to start a, a business, which I think he called Allied Enterprises, something like that, and starts buying yachts. And the, Parsons actually wrote a, a little book about these uh, escapades in his attempt to get his money back. And, and he didn't get his money back. Um, he, did, he won a court case in Florida against Hubbard, but he didn't get his money back. And I think that's a commonplace for people who dealt with Ron Hubbard. You don't get your money back. Yeah. So, yeah, something that you've you've just you've said is really interesting. I'm just thinking about what it was about this time. You were talking about trying to control other people. Scientology was founded in 1953. I've just seen MK Ultra from the government was also 1953. Oh. I suppose we could we could tell people what you know. Some people might not know what that is. The same year. What was it about that sort of time that was there a fear of a loss of control people wanted to be able to control other people i think that that's true and in the military intelligence community they'd seen um the minzetki trial particularly in stalinist russia but they'd seen the purge trials in the 30s and it appeared that the russians had taken the techniques of ivan pavlov and learned how to make people behave as as robots the reality of the Stalinist purges is is a lot simpler. They said, if you don't say these things on the witness stand, we'll torture your children to death. Yeah. But yeah. the American community <laughs> thought, and then in 1949, Mao Zedong releases his thought reform program, the re-education program, which um, we saw again in Xinjiang a few years ago. And millions of Chinese people were put through camps and we learned the word brainwashing um, from the Chinese sinal, meaning to wash brain. <laughs> and th this, there was a paranoia, the, the fear that communism was going to take over, which was a very rational fear. You know, Stalin did move right the way through Eastern Europe. China fell. Um, so, you know, it, the, the world under communism with somebody like Stalin or Mao Zedong in charge would have been a very horrible place. So one can understand that the American military 
found themselves in a situation where there was no other force in the world that could resist Russia and China. And they were sold on the idea that they had to develop mind control techniques. And this is the other element of Scientology. You've got one element, which is uh, supernaturalism. And the parallels with Crowley are incredible when you look into them. I, um, well, 30 years ago, wrote a paper called Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, which I think is one of my finest titles. And um, it's stimulating and stirring. You know? And in there, I show that there are tens of ideas that Scientology borrows directly from Crowley. And Hubbard, of course, referenced the book they come from. So he was aware of it. Um, it's a book called uh, Magic in Theory and Practice. Um, so that's one element. And the other element is mind control. And Hubbard would say, you know, we can brainwash faster than the Russians. I think it's total amnesia in 20 or 30 seconds. And he's boasting about this to Scientologists. We can use this system as a brainwashing system. And it runs alongside the supernaturalism. And of course, curiously, the CIA went the same way, that after they'd spent years torturing and persecuting thousands of innocent people in the attempt to find out how to completely control somebody, they then switched over to the Spoonbender program, um, which your friend John Ronson talked about in the Men Who Stare at Goats, which later became a movie of a... MK Ultra. MK Ultra, MK Naomi, um, Operation Bluebird. There are uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of projects that were under the umbrella of, of these these things. And, and let me put in that, that last week, um, my dear friend Alan Shefflin passed away and he wrote, uh, co-wrote The Mind Manipulators in 1978. One of the, there were two books, Walter Boat was the other, that came out at the same time that exposed these programs. And, and, and that book's still you know, a really remarkable piece of work. So what Hubbard is doing, his his own beliefs are never made fully evident to Scientology, which is fairly typical for cult leaders. You know, they, they don't want you to know what they're really thinking, because what they're really thinking is, I'm going to control and enslave you, and you're going to give me all your money and do everything I want. And that's not usually the tagline for a cult group. You know, they, they, they don't usually advertise that tremendously. Hubbard, it said... First read Crowley's Book of the Law, which is a tiny and weird little tract, when he was 16 years old. So that would have been in 1927. I was able to find that he'd belonged to the ancient and mystical order of the Rosy Cross, the Amorc Rosicrucians, uh, by writing to them and asking them. <laughs> and I happened to have picked the right one. And they said, yeah, he did the first two neophyte degrees. So he was very interested in the supernatural and things magical. And then with Parsons, made this attempt to pretty much incarnate the devil. If we skip on to the end so we can bracket this, the very last thing we have from Hubbard was an issue that was on the highest and most secret level of Scientology, which is operating Thetan level 8. And this was not released until two years after Hubbard died. He was not, not that stupid. Um, to, to let people get this. And it's meant to be, this is when you will become at cause over psychological and physical matter, energy, space and time. So you'll be able to make planets explode and, um, you know, get to the front of the queue in the supermarket and, you know, make people bend to your will. This is what was promised and it had been promised throughout Scientology. This was always the aim. That you'd be able to leave your body and make things happen at will. Um, never happened. Dealt with more than a thousand Scientologists and have pleaded with them to do anything at all. You know, it's usually I'd give a talk and I'd put a little bit of tin foil on the table and say, if that moves at all during the talk, then I will believe that Scientologists really do have superpowers. Well, well hang on, hang on, because... I interviewed a Scientologist called Katie Lohman, who's still in Scientology, and I'll, I'll put uh, an end screen for those watching on YouTube at the end so you can click through to that. And she says that Tom Cruise, who we know is OT8, right, I think, at least OT7, but we think OT8, um, visited her in a dream 
to recruit her. So what do you say to that clear evidence, John? That, that's absolute proof. And I have to, um, you know, take away the 40 years of work I've done on this subject. You, you've got me there, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. And, and how many bodies? Yeah. B- she, she genuinely believes that. Yeah. And how many bodies did Tom Cruise have at the time? Um, three bodies. One more than Ron Hubbard. So at the very end, they issue this thing in 1988 and there is a bulletin on it at the beginning of it that they have to very quickly remove. And so it's only there for a week. But because a number of Scientologists who'd been waiting for years for this wonderful new level, they come along and they find this thing. And in it, Hubbard says that he's the Antichrist and Lucifer. So 1946, trying to incarnate the Antichrist. 1988, done and dusted. He is the Antichrist. At the same time as claiming that you can be a Christian and a Scientologist, which is a, a little bit of a, of a paradox. You know. So I guess one of the things with Scientology that a lot of people who only have like a passing knowledge uh, make the mistake of is they think Lord Zenu, you find out about Lord Zenu, and Lord Zenu must be the god of Scientology, whereas he's actually the antagonist, isn't mm-hmm. he? And the idea is that th- that these thetans were brainwashed these are the things in, inside all of us or whatever to believe in christianity and all of these religions mm-hmm. when really they should be going after you know they should believe in scientology so christianity is the enemy of scientology so it sort of makes sense that he's the antichrist oh absolutely and I, and he always was I, you know that um there is evidence that through the early years of scientology he was still um practicing ritual magic through the 1950s uh, the evidence is a bit difficult because it comes from his eldest son, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., uh, commonly known as Nibs. And Nibs twice, to my knowledge, signed declarations of perjury. So we have to be very careful with what he said. But having examined it very thoroughly, I'm pretty sure that, that his recollections where he talks about things he experienced are true. What's not true in the narrative is where he repeats what his father had told him and it wasn't true when he was told it. So one of the things that Nib said, that there's an incredible manuscript which has not been published and and I hope that one day it will be, I have a copy of it, um, called The Telling of Me by Me, written by Nibs Hubbard. And in this he, he makes a variety of claims which, which I think are probably true saying that from the age of 16, his father was completely taken with ritual magic and that he considered himself to be Crowley's successor, the Beast 666, the Antichrist, Lucifer, whichever negative character you want. And Scientology is, it's a looking glass. Everything in it is the opposite of what it seems. It claims that it's going to liberate you and make you self-determined. But it's pretty clear that to be self-determined, you're going to have to do exactly what Ron Hubbard says. So you'll be able to think for yourself as long as you agree completely with Ron Hubbard. And, of course, you can't disagree with him. It's, you know, you can't go along and say, well, this bit of Scientology is wrong, even if you have evidence. When you... And I had this experience when I was involved, and it's it's 40 years ago since I was involved, um, that I would say, well, look, he says one thing here and he contradicts it here. And you'd be told that you'd have to work that out for yourself and that you couldn't take the more recent thing as being true. And there were, you know, Scientology is replete with contradictions, but you can't question them because to become self-determined, you have to believe everything you're told. (laughs) So... You know, it in between those dates, 1946, 1988, Hubbard, of course, died in 1986. In between those times, Hubbard continues to practice magic. But Scientology becomes the ritual. Um, and we became, there's a, again, in that same Philadelphia doctorate course, Hubbard admits the truth, and I think the most important truth about Scientology. He says, everything's a game. Life is a game. You know, we're just playing a game. We're just spiritual beings. We'll be absolutely fine. Nothing can harm us in any way. We are perpetual and eternal. And so we're just playing a game. And in a game, there are pieces. And the pieces mustn't know what the rules of the game are. 
And then there are the players. And the players are to keep the rules of the game away from the pieces. So the player at the moment is David Miscavige. The pieces are everybody else in Scientology. That he is keeping away from them the real rules, what's really going on. But then Hubbard says, then there is the game maker. And the game maker doesn't have to follow the rules. And he's, yeah. he's the game maker. And he didn't follow the rules. You know, he didn't follow any of the rules that he laid down. Um, so at the heart of this, and the most central thing is within the Crowleyite system, you have what's called a holy guardian angel. And this is the idea that everybody has this, what the Romans would call a tutelary divinity. Uh, the, the word we have from Latin is genius, um, which is the name for the, this little being that comes into being to look after you through your life. And Hubbard believed very deeply in this. Uh, I interviewed a woman in 1984, Joe Scott, and she'd been his secretary in London in 1954, and, and she was great. And she said, um, there was, he'd said, turn around to her one day and he said, you know, the book, Dianetics, the mental science of modern health, sorry, the modern science of mental health. He said, I wrote that in three weeks. It was automatic writing dictated by the Empress. And 30 years later, this woman said to me, what was he talking about? And I said, I think I can fill you in. There's a, a guy called A.J. Burks, who was a major in the Marines down at Paris Island. He was a major pulp writer. He wrote more pulp stories than Hubbard did, probably about 800. And he and Hubbard were friends, and he was a kind of mentor to Hubbard. And as far as I can tell, he was not a, a bad human being. But he had this idea that there are all of these little beings, which he called the little its, all, all around us. And he said in his autobiography, which is called Monitors, um, and monitors are like holy guardian angels, this idea that you've got somebody that's looking over your shoulder. And he said that, that when the redhead visited him and he identifies Hubbard, you know, it's Hubbard he's talking about because he talks about him being a barnstorming pilot and other claims Hubbard made, that the redhead could see the littlets. He could have them jumping between his fingers and stuff like this. And the redhead told him, Ron Hubbard told him, that he was never frightened when he was flying a glider because he could see the Empress on the wing. And the Empress is, has long flowing red hair and a green dress. So I, you know, I got little bits and pieces of this story from all over and put it together. The Empress, um, th there is a place where Hubbard in a book called Dianetics, The Evolution of a Science, says that he used automatic writing as one of his techniques. So that confirmed what Joe Scott had said. If we look to those same Philadelphia doctorate co course lectures, he talks about the fool being the highest aspiration, the fool in the tarot deck being the highest aspiration of mankind, that you can get to a point where nothing will hurt you, everything will pass through you, and you won't care. Now, he's taking this from the Book of Thoth by Alistair Crowley, um, he refers to the fool card as having an alligator snapping at the heels of the fool. Nearly all tarot decks have a dog. The Crowley deck has an alligator. And we then get into this and we find the Empress card in the tarot deck. And we go full circle. Crowley says that the Empress is Haythor. Um, I had this situation. There was a case in, in Los Angeles in 1984 involving my dear friend Jerry Armstrong. And... Documents were put into this case, which had come out of Hubbard's private archive collection, which Armstrong had, had gathered. And among them, there was a document called the Blood Ritual, which is referred to in the transcripts of the case. Somewhere in the early 1990s, the man who'd been hired by Scientology as Hubbard's biographer, Omar Garrison, and then paid hundreds of thousands of dollars not to publish his book, suddenly arrived on my doorstep. He'd flown over from the US without making an appointment, knocked on my door, and there he was. And he said, they keep kicking my door down to try and take back all this material I have about Hubbard. I want them to stop doing this. So I've come to England, and I'm going to tell them that I've met John Azak, 
and I'm going to give him all the documents if anything happens again. I presume nothing happened after that because he never contacted me again. But he said, and to prove good faith, I'm going to show you this document. You cannot copy it. You cannot write it down. But this was the blood ritual, the thing that had been mentioned in court. And this was a deal, handwritten Hubbard document, a deal between Ron Hubbard and the Egyptian goddess Hathor. And the Egyptian goddess Hathor um, is basically publicly seen as, as a spotted cow that feeds humanity. Among magicians like Alistair Crowley, and Crowley writes about this, she is called the destroyer of mankind. This is the empress. Hmm. This is who Ron Hubbard worshipped. In Crowley was keen on crossing between mythologies. He wasn't particularly good at it either, but let's not get into, into that. Um, so Hathor in the Greek system would be Artemis. In the Roman system, it would be Diana. And so he calls one of his daughters Diana, and he calls his first subject Dianetics. Um, uh. There was a Crowleyite group called Dianism at the same time. So we start getting this elaborate web of ideas that Hubbard was seeking to basically control humanity. Um, and he did, I think, Scientology's methods of psychological enslavement still haven't been beaten. You know, even Nexium, which uh, got seriously bad and stole a lot from Scientology. Scientology is incredibly difficult to undo. You know, once people have been immersed in it, they can walk away and think they're done with it. But you have to actually you have to actually look at it. You have to actually see what you've come to believe and question those beliefs carefully because they're very dangerous. You know, the ideas within Scientology. You sent me this fascinating FactNet report about Hubbard and, and the occult. And mm. uh, one part you've said here, Scientology is using many Hollywood celebrities to promote its agenda, but most Scientologists, celebrity and non-celebrity alike, as well as the general public, are ignorant of the satanic black magic background of its founder and how he used these materials to form the core mm. of his secret sacred scriptures is it really possible that you can get like let's say tom cruise ot8 you're spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars you've done countless studying and all these things and still have no awareness that this is all based around black magic and and all that kind of stuff absolutely and and a lot of it's be because he kind of rephrases magic um that where crowley would talk about thelema or the will um Hubbard will talk about intention. And you start sort of finding that, um, sort of scrolling down here to find some of the, the Crowley quotes, uh, uh, the Hubbard and the Occult. Um, I thought you were having an epiphany. You, look, you looked like you were looking at with an epiphany oh, into the distance, but oh. it was actually the, the screen you're looking at. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, what what... Hubbard describes as the operating Thetan, the spirit who is in charge, is a Thetan exterior outside of the body can have, but doesn't have to have, a body in order to control or operate thought, life, matter, energy, space and time. And so we find that, um, you know, parallel ideas, so... You know, an essential idea of Scientology is, is past lives. Now, as you know from our last conversation, I'm working on a book about Charles Manson and his involvement with Scientology. And I'm truly shocked when I came to this and started reading about it. I thought, well, you know, Scientology had some slight influence on Manson. It's important that people know about that. But having narrowed a dozen books... Uh, including five accounts by former members of the family and watched lots of interviews, it's very evident that Charles Manson never stopped practising Scientology. And wow. probably the most dangerous thing about Manson, the thing that, that made everything happen, is that he believed he was the reincarnation of Jesus. He talked about being Manson, the son of man. He actually enacted the crucifixion as 
realistically as possible in front of his followers while they were tripping on LSD. <laughs> yeah. More than once. So Manson had this idea, and I'm kind of going, well, where did he get this idea? It's like, okay, 1961, 62, 14 months, he's studying Scientology with a man called Lainey Arema, who had a professional qualification in Scientology. Um, and part of this would be past life regression. So I am pretty confident that Manson came to believe he was Jesus because of Scientology, because of Scientology's practices. Now, to fit that into Crowley, Crowley said there is no more important task than the exploration of one's previous incarnations. So past lives, which is the term Crowley used and the term Hubbard used, is extremely important to the, the subject. Yeah, um, it's pretty. It's it's pretty remarkable. A lot of this. I mean, to what extent did Hubbard really? Do you think he had this kind of cognitive dissonance where he? Because the, the reason I ask this, I think I think in the public perception of L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, they imagine a snake oil salesman mm -hmm. who said, you know, was a sci-fi writer and said, if you want to make a, if you want to make a, be a millionaire, wasn't it? You just make a religion. Yeah. Is there a sort of split brain where the other part of his brain still actually really believes in all of this Lucifer and uh, Xenu and, and black magic stuff? I I think that he, yeah, that he was trying to kill himself. That's the first thing. This is a man who was ill all of his life. Um, he he got out of seeing combat in World War Two by claiming he had ulcers. It's interesting that the x-rays never showed any ulcers. But he talked for many years in the 50s about terror stomach. So he was a man who was in a state of panic. Um, he had asthma. He was quite badly short-sighted. He smoked 100 cigarettes a day and founded a drug rehabilitation group. You know. um, yeah, we can stop your addiction, no problem. Um, he was a and, and he had these enthusiasms, so he would come along, and when you read the list of things that he said he could cure using his therapeutic system, he suffered from all of them. You know, short-sightedness, asthma, bursitis in his shoulder. Interesting. And spent a lifetime never actually dealing with them. But what he did do was what faith healers do, that, that you, you get a, a kind of hypomanic or manic state, you know, a high state, a euphoric state, where you feel great and there's an adrenaline surge, which of course has endorphins on the back of it, so you're really high, and you can get up out of your wheelchair and walk. But after about three days, there's a collapse, what in Scientology is called a roller coaster. And Hubbard experienced this it, it pretty much every winter. He had bronchial pneumonia. So 1965's bout of bronchial pneumonia, which he thought was going to kill him, gave us the, sorry, 1964's gave us the clearing course. 1966, bronchial pneumonia gave us OT3, the Xenu and the body thetans and all of this stuff. And then in 76, 77, somewhere there, bronchial pneumonia gave us the OT5, which was originally called New Era Dianetics for Operating Thetans, which is a little bit of a mouthful. Um, so I think, but I don't think there's a split. I think this is the idea of doubling, which the brilliant Robert J. Lifton puts forward with the Nazi doctors, the idea that, you know, the gangster looks so frightening with his luger in his hand, but when he gets home to his children, he's a family man, to put it in the words of Mick Jagger. Um, very great philosopher of our time, I think. Um, because that is, that's a possible way of looking at it. But I don't think Hubbard was doubled. I think he was bipolar and I think he got too high and thought that he was, you know, a, an absolute genius who could solve all problems. And then he got too low. And I've done many interviews with people who saw him when he was kind of crying and cowering in bed and, and saying what a failure he was. So I think that it depended on which part of, of the manic depressive cycle he was in, what he believed. And it is true that you know, one of the tests for depression is if you say to somebody, uh, give me five happy memories, and if they're truly depressed, they'll go, can't think of anything. Because we see through a grey lens when, when we're distressed. Um, again, with somebody who's in hypomania, the false happiness, if you say, think of five sad memories, they won't be able to do it. So th that 
you know, with him, he was moving through this cycle all the time, you know, right, right from, and also probably impacted by temporal lobe epilepsy, in which you don't have fits or seizures that can be seen, but the 18 characteristics of the Bethidio temporal lobe epilepsy uh, symptoms, he had all 18 of those symptoms, um, one of which is hypographia, that you can't stop writing. Well, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific writer in history. So I think we can tick that one. But another is this sense of um, incredible deep perception of the universe, that, that things are more, reality is more real for a certain period of time to such people. Um, and you know, I think probably quite a lot of spiritual practices have been started by people who were temporal lobe epileptics. And in these states, he he talks, you know, he, he said he saw the Empress. You know, this wasn't something he dreamed. He actually saw and conversed with the Empress and set about making himself the beast. The, you know, and there are all sorts of other claims because he claims to be Maitreya or Mateya, the future Buddha who will save all of humanity. And I think we can say that that's not true. <laughs> because we're not in nirvana and he's dead so but it, yeah there are all sorts of claims and they are largely magical claims about having supernatural abilities and being able to do things which of course he never managed to do well do, does scientology have any teachings or beliefs that resonate with the christian concept of the end days and you know and, and how might they be interpreted by followers well it's interesting that, that both scientology and the manson cult are founded by people who used the book of Revelation. That you know, Manson, as a kid, was brought up as a, a literalist Christian. Um, the Hubbard flirts with it, you know, so from time to time, you know, when Dianetics came out, it was going to be a race. The history was going to be a race between catastrophe and Dianetics, is what was said. So you've got this kind of apocalyptic idea. He buys into the nuclear fear, Rise, writes a book in the 50s called All About Radiation, in which he misunderstands physics profoundly, but, you know, let's not get into that. In, I think it was 1977, when I was still involved, we suddenly got this bulletin saying, I want Scientologists to survive World War Three," And I interviewed a guy who was, um, in 1981, was on the 14-member watchdog committee in charge of Scientology, and he said that Hubbard had sent them uh, what was called an advice, which said, um, everybody's going to die. The only people I can save are you 14 people, um, which in fact inspired this young man, who was 18 at the time and in the governing body of Scientology, inspired him to leave because he said, well, if, if my mum and dad and my sister are going to die, I want to be with them when it happens. I, you know, I don't want to be with these 13 other people on the watchdog committee so there is an apocalyptic tinge but but nothing quite as strange as um the book of the secrets of enoch or um, the revelation of saint john the divine hmm. how how do uh some of the well even the beginning stories about xenu are there any sort of any of these stories that you think relate to or are based on or inspired by some of the traditional occult or those kinds of teachings I, I think he does, you know, he's a storyteller and he he makes a cosmology. I, I was surprised when, when I came to write, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. Um, I sort of went, well, what's the cosmology of Scientology? What do Scientologists believe? And I kind of went, there's no clear statement. You know, we've, we've got the most prolific author in history who's telling us that logic means you've got to determine the importance of ideas You've got to prioritise ideas, and he never did it. So I think that Blue Sky has the only cosmology of Scientology, which pulls pieces from all over the place in Scientology, say, well, this is what Hubbard seems to have believed. And he, you know, I, I think that if there is genius and perhaps cunning's the, a better word for it, that Hubbard promised us what we want. So... We want to be super powerful. We want to be resilient against all emotional disaster and catastrophe. And so he said, you're all super beings. You're all gods, fundamentally. And I'm going to release your godlike powers. 
what is incredible is is the the kind of you know consistency principle the sunk cost fallacy of throwing good money after bad that having done a Scientology course that didn't make you a supernatural you know a superhero that you'll still go on to the next course and you know so seeing people go through all of these courses and become you know bitter and distressed and defensive and you know aggressive about anybody that wants to have a an evidence-based conversation with them you know that's oh no not listening not listening you know and th these are people who are at the very basic level of Scientology have become communication releasers whereby according to the sacred scripture of Scientology they can communicate freely with anyone on any subject but you go up to them and say look here is Ron Hubbard saying this about Alistair Crowley and that like, don't want to know don't want to know so it it really mm. is an incredible tangle that 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 eventuates and so what Hubbard has done is he's created slaves he's created people to worship him and I you know I back in Blue Sky which was originally published in 1990 um, I speculated that Hubbard wanted to become a god following traditions that you'll find in China and in Rome in ancient Rome whereby you become a god by being remembered and there's a 1938 letter that he wrote to his first wife that I was not meant to have a copy of. And I did get a copy of. And he says that his only goal is to smash his name into history. That's it. That's all he wanted. And yeah, we then find that when he left $648 million that he'd bilked Scientologists out of, because none of this came from his fiction titles. They lost money. This is all 600, and that's what he left. He'd spent more than that, probably. Um, $500 million went to the Church of Spiritual Technology, and all it's there for is initially to perpetuate the name L. Ron Hubbard, to make sure that Ron Hubbard is remembered. And I'm quite happy about that. I think we should remember him, Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, you know. Uh, all of the horrible people of history should be remembered so so that we we don't get pulled into the you know the same difficulties again yeah i i, th I think so as well uh, always remember always discuss these things um it's, it's it's quite Shakespearean as well. This idea that if I have to die, despite you know he was obviously obsessed, L. Ron Hubbard, with uh, living, living longer, curing his illnesses and all of these things, but also obsessed with finding a way to live beyond uh, the the temporal realm. And that was what you know Shakespeare was really into as well. I hope my writing will survive and those kinds of things. It will it will survive longer than me. But um, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. The, the closing lines of Sonnet eighteen, the brilliant Sonnet eighteen. Yeah. What a narcissist! But he was right. <laughs> Rembrandt used to say, "I'm well, the greatest painter in the world," and you go, "Well, I wish you wouldn't say it, but you are right." You know. Well, he was Shakespeare was right, I suppose, but it, only in a really abstract sense that, like, he lives on in his words, or he lives on in. He was obsessed, wasn't he, in the sonnets with either his writing or or a child or some boy or that he'd met, like someone would live on and that would mean he lives on, but he didn't live on really and I don't think you can. No, it, except, it, of course, I think it was Eric Erickson, the psychiatrist, who, who said there are five routes to immortality. The first of them is, is spiritual, the second is your children, the third is your ideas, the fourth is your monuments, and the fifth is your chemicals that those are the things that will live on beyond you. So the idea of immortality gained through a, a monument, a, an artistic work, or, or through an idea, is probably valid, um, especially if you're not too obsessed with, with the idea of living forever and lighting up the mm. sky with your fame. Um, sorry, you, you're the singer. Mm. You, no, you could sing that for us. Um, I'm the, that, people won't know that reference because <laughs> we were talking before we started recording about the guy with my name who was a singer but he yeah. died and I think that brought um, but you live on you live on you live on so yeah, you are the continuation of Andrew Cold yeah Proust said that I spoke to his widow oh and and was she surprised when you said hey this is Andrew Cold <laughs> She, I think I get confused for him, you know, on Twitter as as happens with names and things. And she still uses his old 
Twitter account to sort of go through it and respond to fans and things, which is quite sweet, really. And so we had a, a little back and forth, which was interesting. I, just for those who don't know, Andrew Gold wrote, thank you for being a friend. I don't want you to click and research him because the more you do, uh, not that I want to compete with someone who's passed away, but the more you do, the the longer it will take for me to surpass him on the fr- first page of Google. So, you know, I've told you all you need to know, really. Yes, yeah, don't don't check that at all. And mm. and you could of course follow the great Donald Trump's example and have the real Andrew Gold on Twitter. <laughs> the real Andrew Gold. That would be sending a, a a a message of you know attack to the dead Andrew Gold. Unfortunately, yeah, but he can't get um, you. He can't get you. Be- <laughs> No, you can't. It would it would be a bit much, though. You were speaking before about how defensive Scientologists are about mm. these things you've been speaking about. You know, they just won't want to hear it. They'll want to hear it. What would happen if you went up to Tom Cruise and said, listen, mate, you, you, your whole religion is founded on um, satanic uh, rituals and things? How, how might he respond? He'd bite you in the knees. He's not very big. Yeah. Um, he... he- he would probably jump over a couch and say that he's better qualified than any medical doctor to treat illness or something like that. Uh, it it it's it's called cognitive dissonance, yeah, and it's the most researched idea in psychology. And yet, you know, and we hear the term, but it's very important. If somebody disagrees with us, the stronger their evidence is, the stronger our belief becomes. And, you know, this is the thing, you know, I left Scientology and and I, you know, left the mother cult and was involved with setting up the so-called independent movement and then went, this is nonsense. And then I spent years, 12 years, talking with people who've been involved in Scientology. And it took me about seven years to really get hold of how you get round the cognitive dissonance, how you can sit down with somebody. I had one guy that morning... He had given his success story on his Scientology course, now fantastic it was. And in the afternoon, I brought him to think about what he'd been involved with, and he decided to leave. Um, so it's really difficult because we think that logic will do it. We think that evidence will do it. It doesn't. You know, there are a series of steps. So what does? Well, you first of all have to f- create some sort of rapport where the person is willing to talk with you. Now, Scientology kind of, by telling everybody not to talk to John Atack, they kind of spoiled the game eventually. Um, but once you get the person to talk to you, the, the thing I would do in, you know, and I, I spoke with hundreds of people, probably now about 600 people in, in their recovery from Scientology. But some of those people at the beginning of that journey were fanatics. And I knew that I would only get a day with them. You know, nowadays with cell phones, you don't even get that. Um, And it's something I stopped doing in, what, 1995. um, Because it's just too stressful being harassed all the time, you know. Um, But to be able to sit down with somebody and first of all get on side with them. So say that, you know, their mum had hired me to, to talk with them. And I took on this kind of work so that I could talk for free with other people. So, you know... Uh, of the 600 people that I've helped in recovery, only two of them gave me any money. And so I hope the rest of them are watching and, and we'll start going, oh, we ought to send him some money. You know, that's not really fair, is it? Um, but I funded that work and all the other work I did by doing interventions. Um, and the thing was to get into the room and to get on side with the person so they wouldn't know I was John Atak, the evil suppressive who has outstripped Xenu by far. Um, they just have this guy who was there, who was friendly, and my opening line, and it took me a little while to get to it, was going with their mum. And a lot of people who do interventions, take the whole family in, and everybody they can find in. I would take one person in because I'm not there to control the person. It's called milieu control by Robert J. Lifton. I- I'm there to get them give them information they don't have and allow them a safe space in which to consider that information and make a decision. I'm very happy to say that everybody who talked to me decided that they didn't want to be involved with Scientology anymore. So I'm quite pleased about that. Quite smug, in fact, about that. Um, But the first statement would be, your mum, or whoever, believes 
You've been brainwashed by a cult. I'm here to help you explain the reality to her. And from that starting point... Well, I would feel patronised. I'd feel, I'd feel like, I know what you're doing here, John. Come on, you're, you, you've been hired by my mum to come and talk to me. I know what you're up to. Yeah, but you're a, a deeply suspicious person. Um, so normal people don't, don't have, have your problem. <laughs> um, I, it, right. it didn't fail. Um, and, and they may have felt patronised. They may have felt... But, but it got me into the room in a sentence. And that was the thing. And I then show them uh, a video which is on my channel called uh, Captive Minds, Hypnosis and Beyond, which has great early 1980s, huge lapels in it and wild hair. Um, but the content is extremely good. And they sit and watch that. Scientology is not mentioned in it. And so they'd feel safe. And it is that. It's creating a, an environment that's comfortable for the person and letting them know the reality, which is I'm their advocate. I'm not there to change anybody's mind, not, not bothered. I'm there to give them information and they can then come to a decision. And in every case but one, that worked. The one case where it didn't, um, we ran out of time and we, we drove we were in Eastbourne, of all places. We drove up to East Grinstead, where I was still living yeah. at the time. And when we got out of the car and this young woman was really not quite convinced and I wasn't quite sure what to say because I'd, I'd shown her the fair game law about tricking, lying, suing and destroying people. And she was, yeah, you have to do that to people who are trying to stop Scientology. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then we get out of the car and there are two carloads of Scientologists and people with video cameras and she just looks at me and went, all right, I'm done. <laughs> so sometimes they're helpful. But, but generally, get, you get in there and you then have to establish authority, which is to say, I know more about Scientology than they do. I mean, you know, had, had one situation where I sat with a guy and, and I said, did he know about the Hubbard archives? And he said, no, which is surprising. They should know about it. Um, been collected since, what, 1981. Um, and did he know? Yeah, and I said there are a lot of things that Scientologists don't know. I've decided, and I was quite open about this, that I don't want to do any more Scientology because I'm interested in the history and the background of Scientology now. And did he know, for example, that Hubbard's eldest son, Quentin, by Mary Sue Hubbard, who was named as Hubbard's successor from a very early time, he was going to take Scientology over. Did he know that although he got to the highest level of Scientology, class 12 auditor and uh, OT7 at that time, that, that he was A, gay, and had B, committed suicide. And that thought was enough. You know, half an hour... In fact, I was in with, with uh, some other people who were doing it, doing interventions and I was quite new to their way of doing things and the guy hauled me off he's like you're going too fast you're going too fast and they sat there with the mother the father the sister the sister's boyfriend all watching the television watching this captive minds thing and this young man was looking at the floor and I was the only one paying attention to him and he looked up at me and he said did he really commit suicide and at that point you know that the cognitive dissonance has broken that somebody has accepted that I'm truthful and I, you know, I that time used to carry four bankers boxes of documents with me when I was talking to people. So I could show somebody, say, look, this is where Hubbard said this. You know, and here's the contrary statement, you know, crippled and blind at the end of World War II, beat up three, three petty officers. He also said in a magazine interview that he had no war wounds, you know, but um, he's not necessarily trustworthy, Ron Hubbard, I found. So you establish authority and you are then in this strange situation where that you're a, I'm a kind of library and you know or an encyclopedia and people can ask me questions and they will they'll come up with the things that have always bothered them why do they wear sailor suits why does it cost so much money why is there so much shouting involved you know um yeah. those sort of things yeah and that's how you get them out i mean that's a remarkable thing it must be a, quite a nice feeling for you having left yourself being able to bring people out yes but but the being steamrolled by the cult at the same time, you know, it was horrific. I, I, you know, my health went. I lost a five-bedroom house that's now worth three quarters of a million pounds. Um, we had a thirty thousand pound mortgage on it. 
um my marriage came apart you know and friends started attacking me because Scientology has a you know they penetrate your friend network and start telling little stories about you um it it was really it was it was it was not a you know there's it was the best of times it was the worst of times no it was the worst of times but yeah there's a satisfaction and particularly years later where um you know, I've been contacted in the last couple of weeks by somebody I haven't seen for 40 years and um, who's told me, you know, he's had a successful life since escaping from Scientology. And that that's that's the buzz. That, one of the best things I ever had, I had a letter from a woman who said, um, you won't remember me. And I didn't. She said 15 years ago, and it's more than 15 years ago I got the letter, 15 years ago, I spent an afternoon with you and my life was in complete chaos because of Scientology. And I just want to say that I'm happily married, I have a successful career and I have children. And I put that down to what happened on that afternoon. And, you know, I'm, I'm a catalyst. It's, I didn't do anything. I didn't perform any magic trick. But I listened to, you know, what was happening in her world and pointed out the, the way in which Scientology was negatively influencing her, and so yeah, that that is that's great when when somebody you know recognizes that their life benefited from from something that you did. Yeah, yeah, that that's happiness. It really that's what is. that's what it's about. Yeah, that's yeah. I think it's happiness. I think that's what it's about, like purpose and and helping others to fulfill roles and to leave vicious cults. It's mm. it's, it's really something. John, where do you want to send people today? Where can what should they go and watch and and do? Well, if, if if they want to know more about the magic, then uh, there's a chapter called His Magical Career in my book, Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, uh, on my channel, my YouTube channel, John Atak Family and Friends. Um, there's a, a, a piece called Hubbard and the Occult, um, which is what we've been referring to today, which I was surprised. I, I reread it before sending it to you and I went, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so many little facts you know yeah. and um that but you can find yeah. me reading it out on camera on my channel um or if you just look up hubbard in the occult um what i'm touting today is we've released an audio book um of a little booklet called scientology the cult of greed which has what i consider to be the most important information about scientology but presented in a way that should be accessible to anybody you know, where, whether or not they've had the misfortune of encountering Scientology before. So that's available as a book, an e-book, and an audio book on ACX through Amazon. Go check it out, peoples, and support my lovely guest, John, who's been on the show so many times. Many of you already know him already. Keep watching this channel. There'll be some things that we've talked about popping up above, above my head. I think the previous thing with John as well about uh, Charles M Manson. And hit the like button. I think it helps it all spread out. But yeah, keep on watching.